There we go. Hey, good morning. Welcome, everybody. I can see you vaguely there um, through the lights. So what are some people's fall favorites? Pumpkin spice everything, okay. Everything. I respect that, okay. Levi, what is your... Um... It's the combination of like a crisp day okay. with like warm bacon. Put them together. Random. Okay, I like that. I like, I like like half a pump of pumpkin spice into my grande long shot Americano. That's like my fall drink right there. So incredible, okay. It's like Americano misto with a half a pump of pumpkin spice. That's me getting crazy right there. All right, write that down. Um, it's a hack, it's incredible. I'm gonna pray and uh, welcome to Live Free Church. I'm Colby, if you're joining us on the live stream, uh, we're glad you're here. Um, we meet every, ten, every Sunday at 10 a.m. at the Grand 10 Theater, and I'm just gonna pray, and we'll get into a message about what does it look like to follow Jesus. And um, I think it's very timely for us in a pandemic. Um, in 2021. Let's pray. God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your guiding and directing us. I thank you for this group of people who love you passionately, who want to serve you. Um, Lord, we want to serve you with all of our lives. That discipleship isn't an instant thing. It's not an instant fix. It's not um, being formed in a minute, but formed over the course of a life. I love how Eugene Peterson says that discipleship is a long obedience in the same direction. I pray that for for this church, for us individually, Lord, that it be all about you, about following you, obedience in a long direction, every single day, waking up and wanting to follow you, Jesus, more and more and more, every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's a question. Have you guys ever been given good news that became awful news? You know, if you're at a moment in your life where you've been given some good news that eventually became, like, not the greatest news, I think this past year that, you know, we've been given some great news. And I'm not, like, asking for anyone's feedback on what they're for with the vaccine. Okay, I'm not, like, looking for that. We've gotten emails already um, on our Facebook group, but um, on our Facebook page. But what, what happened was that there's a vaccine that was going to be rolled out, and they said, we're going to be coming back to an ordinary life, normal life, soon. I think they said by fall, actually, right? Like, I don't know about you, but like for me, when someone gives me like some advice, I'm like, I cannot wait to get back to some normalcy. I remember I was like, I cannot wait to be on an airplane again. You know, like that, like the dry air in an airplane where it's like you come off and like, I need water. Like, I can't wait for those moments. So this past fall, someone said, well, actually, we're going on a conference um, to a place called Calgary. Maybe you've heard of it, right? It's been the news. Alberta's been the news. And so I'm like, yes, I cannot wait to go to a conference in Calgary with some people I love. It's like a church planting congress of Canada. And it's like just a church planting conference. And, and all of a sudden, it got canceled, right? And they're like, actually, no, great news, people. Great news. The conference isn't live. It's going to be digital. Right? Is that, that's terrible news for me. I, don't, I want nothing else digital ever again. I want everything live, okay? I want live people. I want, like, live conferences. Or I want, like, live concerts. I don't want anything digital for a long, 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 long time. And so I was like, oh, this is so, such a downer, such a bummer. Maybe you feel like that. Maybe you feel like this past year there was, like, hope. And then there was, like, a bit of, like, a letdown. Despair. There's this amazing word, which I think sums up our culture in 2021. It's hopium. Have you heard of this before? You've never heard of this? It's like a very, it's a term for like investors use. It's like hopium in the stock market or um, cryptocurrency or investing. But really what it says is it's hope plus opium as though it was a drug. A clinging to unreasonable and unfounded hopes. (laughs) Like, isn't that? Isn't that us? A little bit? Like clinging to unreasonable hopes that maybe times will go back to some sort of normalcy or something different, something that resembles like a 2019, right? Like I remember before we got locked down, I was in Disneyland with my kids. And I was like, that feels like 10 years ago to be in a park without masks on. Like, Man, I love to be eating a churro 
at Disneyland at downtown, like right downtown Disney. There's hopium there. There's like hope plus opium. It's like a drug that we kind of, so much in our culture, we desire. We desire hope. But what happens when things get let down? Disappointment comes in. Right? What happens when things come crashing down? You just feel like despair of like, oh, this is not the way I thought 2021 was going to be. I don't think, what about 2022? I remember someone just recently said, I would rather just go back to lockdowns. <laughs> I was like, what? I would not go back to that. See, I think it comes back to this point for all of us where sometimes we have advice that comes into our life or, or like good news that comes into our life that eventually like feels like slavery because we put our hope in this news. I want to talk about a little bit about good news in the gospel. And I'll explain the gospel is, but if you have Bibles, you flip open your Bible to Mark chapter 1, verse 14. And it's Jesus calling his disciples. It's Jesus, he's, Jesus is starting his ministry in Galilee, and he calls the disciples right after this moment. And we're in Mark's gospel for the next year. And I love Mark's gospel because it's the most succinct, clear gospel I think we have. They say it's the original gospel. It's John Mark's eyewitness account of Jesus' life, who was a follower of Peter. And here's what it says. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14, it says, After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As he passed alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew. Simon's brother cast a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, Jesus told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat putting their nets in order. Immediately he called out to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. You see, when we look at this passage of Scripture, you look at this, the first part of this, right? What it says in Mark's Gospel is that after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus went to the Galilee proclaiming the good news. You see, there's, you think about the good news moving forward that in another translation, it says you're proclaiming the gospel of God, that we believe as a church that the gospel changes people, transforms people. The gospel isn't just like some random word, but it really in this time, in this culture, it was like a proclamation of something happening. For us, the gospel means that, that we believe in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus that changes every area of our life that we're sinful, broken people, and yet we're so incredibly loved by Jesus. See, Mark shows up in the gospel and says, actually, there's a proclamation that's coming down. There's a proclamation that's coming that's about a king and a kingdom. It's a Jesus story that's going to change everything about your life. It's going to reorientate all of your life. When Jesus says the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. I think so often in our culture, people ask, well, what is this good news? Like, why wake up on a Sunday morning to hear terrible news? Right? Like, years ago, I just, like, I stopped watching the news. <laughs> I, wa I read it on Twitter. Because I'm like, man, the news is so depressing. But I think people look at the church through the same lens. They say, what is the good news about the church? What's the good news about Jesus? Maybe they know about a Christian who try to try to sell them something. Or a Christian did a bad thing to them. Maybe that Christian at their work doesn't live out a Christ life like, but actually we're broken people just like anyone else. But the good news is that Jesus came into the world to change the world. If you go back to the beginning of the Bible, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, go back and read that we see that there was a creational order, that we were created to live in a world where all relationships were whole, that they were both psychologically and socially perfect because God was the king. He was the king. He was the ruler. He was over us. But if you move over to the chapter in Genesis 3, you see that, that Adam and Eve, just like us, choose to be our own king. And this is ultimately, I think, I believe this is where destruction lies. That when we say we actually want to be king of our lives, we want to be in control of our lives, we want to have absolute authority over our lives, that's where self-destruction happens. That's where destruction happens in our self-centeredness. 
that ultimately destroys relationships. You see, self-centeredness or self-absorption in our culture, I believe, looks like asking these questions like, am I succeeding? How am I doing? Am I being treated well? Am I proving myself? Am I failing at this? Do I look foolish doing this? Am I being treated justly? You see, think, why do we have breakdowns in our families? Why do we have wars? Why do we have pain relationally in our world? Because I ultimately believe there's a darkness of self-centeredness. It's that everyone's saying, I want a king, but actually I think our culture is deeply saying, we want a king to follow. We want someone to follow. I think that's why when you look at even like an Instagram account, it's like we choose who we follow, right? Like we say, actually, no, I want to follow this person or I follow this political faction or this party. I follow this. Like how come you don't follow this? Like you're an idiot. I want this person to be my king. I want this person to guide us to a better world, to a better reality, to a better whatever it is. We want to be the king of our own domains. But every culture is looking for a king. Every great story for hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, has asked this question, that we want a true king who will slay the dragon, who will rescue us from imprisonment, who will kiss us, who will wake us up, who will lead us home. Every culture wants a king to overcome. In this culture, where Mark wrote this gospel, they wanted Jesus to overthrow the Roman Empire. That's what they were hoping he was going to do. He was going to slay the dragon of Rome. That's what they wanted. But every culture longs for this. And the good news of Jesus is that he declares that the gospel, the kingdom is at hand. And what he's saying is it's going to look completely different. You actually have to repent and believe. See, here's the difference between any other any religion in Christianity. Any other religion says that, that you have to do something in order to connect to God forever. That you have to do something in order to live and earn your way to God's favor. But the gospel, this good news of Jesus Christ, he shows up and says, this is what's been done in human history for you. This is how Jesus lived. This is how he died. So your history would be changed. Not only would history be changed, but your history would be changed if your identity was found in him. You see, the kingdom connects you to God not based on what you have done or haven't done, but on the basis of what Jesus has done for you and for me. Whether you believe in Jesus or not, he has changed human history. He has changed human history forever. But ultimately, he wants to change your history. He wants to change your present and your future. And that's the good news. You see, the kingdom of God is really about repentance and belief. See, under the kingship of Jesus, if you believe in Jesus as your king and your Lord, all the areas of your life will transform and change. Things will be healed. Maybe not the ways you think about them being healed. Maybe like that person who slighted you at work, you're actually able to forgive them. Maybe it's, it's forgiving a friend, a parent, a spouse, a child, It looks like looking at someone going, God, you're healing parts of my life that I thought were separate from your healing touch. But you actually are healing my life. You're restoring my life in ways that might not look to this world like prospering. It might not look like wealth and health, but it might look like a spiritual strength in Christ when you go through the hardest moments of your life that he's there with you, walking alongside you. But the first thing God's kingdom looks like is repentance, Jesus says. Repent and believe. Repentance, so often, I think, in our culture, right, means just like a moment, but actually a moment of saying forgiveness or saying sorry, but actually repentance means like turning it completely around and running the opposite direction. It's like seeing yourself in the mirror. Like, do you ever look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, what is wrong with this person? Only me, maybe, I do that, right? Like, I should run more. I should work out more. But repentance means looking at yourself and saying, what is happening to this person? All this sin, this brokenness. I'm going to turn the opposite direction and run away from that brokenness, run away from that sin, run towards Jesus. 
It might, might look like looking at the places of our life where we're actually running to instead of running to Jesus. It means turning around. Repentance means completely flipping around, like turning 180 degrees and just running the opposite direction. It means being open and honest with the people around us. It means maybe saying that there are spots in my life where I medicate. Maybe I spend too much time drinking or I spend too much time looking at things I shouldn't be looking at online or on Instagram or on TikTok or wherever it is that we run towards, that we medicate our lives, the brokenness of our life. But Jesus says, no, actually it's repentance. That's what my kingdom is about. I love this passage in, in James 5, verse 16. It says here, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, so you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is a very powerful in its effect. I think in our culture, in a very individualistic culture, especially in Canada, where we don't want to like overstep our boundaries on anyone, right? But like, I remember I realized this um, just going through a really like tricky spot where I apologize for everything. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to do that. Uh, my, my therapist once said, why do you always apologize for everything? I was like, I have no idea why I do that. It's because I'm Canadian, right? But look at this passage in James. It says, confess your sins to one another. But in our individualistic culture, sometimes we come to church, and maybe if us have grown up in church for a long time, or maybe it's your first time, but we grew up in church where we come to church, we sit in a seat, and we say a prayer, and we say, God, forgive us for all the sin of our past week. But there's a part of us where we just like, still like walk in so much shame and brokenness. But James is saying here is that actually repentance looks so different. Confessing your sins to one another, praying for one another, so you may be healed. looks different. I remember in February, someone said to me, hey, have you ever done like this thing where you go and you like, it's a full confessional of someone? Like, you like talk about everything you've ever done? And I was like, I am not into that. <laughs> I don't know if that's you, but that's like, wow, that sounds terrifying to me. And so like, you should think about this. You know, you should just go and it's like therapy to confess all the stuff. And I was like, wow, like how long will that take? So I called this friend of mine who, like, who I trust to tell every little deep, dark thing in my life. And I said, hey, um, hey man, uh, I want to do this full confessional. And um, I think we need to done like 45 minutes. And he goes, oh, man, that's going to take like hours. And I was like, what? Hours? Like how bad do you think I am? And he's like, it's going to take a long time. I was like, thanks. I remember I got to this retreat center, and I'm, I'm in this room, and I'm praying, and he comes in, and we start talking about my life. Well, like six hours later, right? And I remember he kept saying, is there anything else? Is there anything else you want to talk about? Is there anything else? And I confessed something. I was like, I told no one this ever. But it started like at small things, Right? It's like the, the, the things that we like forgive ourselves for just so naturally. I was like, God, forgive me for like, you know, when I was eight years old and I was at the IGA in Spall and I stole candy. Right? I put a nickel in, but it was really a quarter. Right? I took three instead of one. Right? And it got like deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And then they come in. I was like, is there anything else you want to like confess? And I was like, oh, I've never told anyone this. I remember at the end of it, he said this thing to me, God forgives you. Every time. It was like so impactful to have someone stand in that gap, even though it's Jesus. I know all of us come here and we confess some of our sin and our brokenness, but have someone walk alongside me and go, I see you, Colby, and I see all of this. Not just like this, but all of that. And I forgive you for, God forgives you for all of that. It felt different. My life felt different. There was like a spiritual healing that took place in my life. When James says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, I believe that could happen in our community groups. And I'm not saying that's a spot where you just go next week and say, hey guys, here's like my whole 360. Here's like every little thing I've ever done. Like that's not the spot to do. Like there's some emotional intelligence here. But it's also saying to people, there's a lot more to my life than you see. I think like 
with my kids this past week. Someone was talking about my kids about how um, someone didn't like one of my kids and they're being babysat. And someone said um, something kind of not great to my son. And I said, hey, what does that sound like to you? They said, I don't know. It sounds like a bully. I said, okay, well, <laughs> obviously. But what does that sound like to you? Let's hear beyond that. I said, I don't know. I said, it sounds like someone's hurting. There sounds like someone who's in pain, who wants to bring you down, not lift you up. So the church community, I believe that we need to lift people up. Confessing our sins just says, hey, I'm just like you. I am not any better. In my community group, I am not like the special pastor. I am just a person that sits around a fire pit in my backyard He's just one of the people with Carling and Mark and Sue and Mark, Jess and Steve. Like, it's just us being the community of God for each other. But Jesus says, repent. Repent of all of it. Repent until you truly feel, I think, empty of all your sin, of all the stuff that holds you back from following Jesus, all the stuff that makes us self-centered, the stuff that actually holds us back to truly following Jesus. And then what does it look like? It looks like belief. It means taking Jesus at his word and trusting him. It means belief in Christ isn't something you achieve, but you freely receive. It's something that Jesus has done ultimately for you. It's experiencing love that's eternal, that's never fading, that never wears out, that's never going to let you down. It's the new engine that God puts in you that drives you through the deep, dark moments of your life. A love that you're like, I don't even understand. When I wake up in the morning, I feel gratitude. I feel thankfulness. I don't know how I get through these moments, but God's getting me through it. It looks like belief. Belief in not my own circumstances or my own control, but belief in that God is working something out for his good, which I might not be able to see in this like brief little moment of my life with the blinders on. See, as Jesus soon speaks with the kingdom of God publicly, he selects his 12 disciples. He selects some disciples, his core group of friends and followers. It says in verse 16, it says, As he passed alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. They had a career. They had a calling. Follow me, Jesus said to them, and I'll make you fish for people. Immediately, this is a word that Mark uses a lot in his gospel. They left their nets and followed him. Going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat pulling their nets in order. Immediately called to them. They left their father, left their dad, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. You see, Jesus immediately calls people. He's calling people out. He's walking alongside a sea and he's saying, hey, follow me. He knew these people. These people knew him. He said, come follow me. You're fishing right now, but I'll make you fish for people. I'll make you fish for men. You see, in that culture, for us, like so often, we like look at these verses and we say, oh my goodness, that is like, I would love if Jesus would just come alongside me at my my concrete job or my construction site or my office and say, just follow me. I'd follow, of course I'd follow him. But in that culture, you have to realize that, that the pupil always chose their rabbi, their teacher. No rabbi, no teacher ever chose their pupils, ever. And I think actually, I similar this past week, this is what we do today, don't we? Like, like we choose who we follow. We choose the influence in our life. We choose like the dogma in our life. We choose what comes into our head. We choose the school that we're going to go to, the thoughts. We choose our friendships. We choose the Instagram accounts that are going to influence us. We choose the people that we let into our life We live in a culture where we get to choose who we follow, who's our teacher, who's our master. We get to choose those things in our life. But Jesus shows up and says, actually, no, the kingdom of God is totally opposite. That You can't have a relationship with God unless he calls you. You can't have a relationship with Jesus unless he calls you first. Who leaves their boats and nets? Simon and Andrew says, come follow me. And once they leave their vocation, He calls James and John. They leave behind their father and their friends right there in the boat. You see, we know in the gospel accounts that these men actually end up again fishing. They end up with their family members. It's like not like they they don't ever see them ever again. They don't ever go back and fish with their dad and their friends. They go back and do those things, but 
What he's saying here is that it's so disruptive in this culture that I think some of you just wash over it. What he's saying is that in this culture that Jesus wants to become king over your family. In that culture, it was all about the family. That was your identity. That's who you are. To leave your dad would be like forsaking your family. But in this culture, I think in an individualist society, it's saying actually, no, give up all your freedoms and your rights to follow Jesus. It's saying actually, when Jesus looks at your life and goes, actually, I want your career. I want every aspect of your life to follow me. Every moment is about following me. You see, I think a lot of times in our, our society, our culture, that we can follow Jesus for a season. But so often when it gets like tough, when it gets like awful, we're like, God, where are you? I'm going to actually bail out on this. I'm going to bail out on following you because I'm just following you. I've chosen you as a teacher for a certain period of time. When things get really tough, I don't know where you are. I don't know if you're good. I don't know if this is true. I don't know if this is real anymore. Like, I've been there. I've been to these moments where it's like, I don't know, God, if, if you're real. John of the Cross says, this is the dark night of the soul sometimes. But here's how you know if you're following Jesus and have been chosen by Jesus. If you say, I'll obey you, Jesus, if my career th thrives, if my health is good, if my family is together, then the thing that's on the other side of the if is your master, your teacher. So you're only following that if my life is good, if my family is together, if I have health, if I have enough money to buy whatever I want whenever I want to buy it at Costco. <laughs> that's just me. You see, if he calls you to follow him, he must be the ultimate goal of your life. See, if you're called by Jesus, you'll never forget that calling. You know, those disciples will never forget that moment. He walked alongside the shore and said, follow me. When he calls them out, he's saying, you should do this. Do you want to do this? And they followed. It will disrupt your life. It will change your life. It will change your identity. It will change your priorities. It will change the things that you, you value and you hold dear towards. You see, Jesus is saying as a teacher is that knowing me and loving me and resembling me, serving me must become the most supreme passion of your life. And everything else becomes second. If you just follow him, you can choose how you want to be influenced by Jesus. You can actually just make God into, just look so much like you or me. But to be called by Jesus looks so different. To be called means you're marked, means you're changed by love, by compassion, by grace. That your worst moments are your worst moments because someone's alongside with you. It's Jesus. What does it look like to live a life that's reorientated, shifted, changed? Eugene Peterson, in his, in his book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, says this. A disciple says, we are people who spend our lives apprenticed to our master, Jesus Christ. We are in a growing, learning relationship always. A disciple is a learner, but not in the academic setting of a schoolroom, rather at the work site of a craftsman. We do not inquire, we don't acquire information about God, but skills and faith. We acquire skills and faith. I remember in high school, someone called me out and said, hey, you should follow Jesus, but come and follow me as I follow Jesus. What he's trying to say is, I will disciple you day after day after day after day, week after week after week. If you follow me, I'm going to show you how it looks like to follow Jesus. See, what does it look like, I think, to ultimately follow Jesus? It looks like 8,000 hours. You look at like, the time frame that Jesus spent with his disciples over the course of three years. And that's just saying it's eight hours a day right? Eight to 10 hours a day. That's roughly 8,000 hours. Malcolm Gladwell in a book called, the, called um, Outliers says that to master anything, you have to spend 10,000 hours doing that. 
He looked at bands like the Beatles and said, actually, when they, they played as a cover band in Germany, they actually invested 10,000 hours into an activity to actually becoming a band before they actually launched their band, which became the most famous band in the history of the world, the Beatles. You see, Jesus' disciples, they spent roughly 8,000 hours with Jesus. That's a lot of time. You think that if we boil down a discipleship to a one hour a week Sunday morning experience, it takes 153 years to hit that. That's an hour a week, 153 years. If you think about that, eight hours or 8,000 hours is roughly 10 years of time if you're spending three hours every day, three hours a day listening to Jesus reading his word, memorizing, sitting in silence and solitude, be with him weekly, daily. It's not just a checklist, but something you actually desire more and more and more. I mean, it's like my friend says in the morning, they, they wake up and they actually listen to worship music and pray together as a couple. Like that is being transformed and changed. That's being a disciple of Jesus every day. Before I, before I wake up, someone told me, when you wake up and grab a cup of coffee in the morning, when you brew your cup of coffee, you have like how many minutes? Depends on like the system, Right? You have a bit of time there. You just, just like open your journal and just be like, God, this is your day. I love you. I want to serve you. I want to be with you. It might look like being in community, being shaped by people, people who don't look like you or sound like you, but love Jesus and ultimately want to love you. I want to remind you and point you back to the hope that's in Jesus. People who remind you not to live in fear, but to live in faith. It looks like repentance. I love Martin Luther. It says, all of life is repentance. All of life is repentance. It's pointing towards Jesus, turning away from our sin and turning towards God who loves us. But, she, but God actually loved us first. He showed us his ultimate love to us, displayed on the cross. It looks like belief, ultimately believing that Jesus is enough for every area of our life. The good news of the gospel is we don't have to actually achieve anything, but we just receive it. That's the grace of God. I'm going to invite the band up to lead us in a couple songs and we can worship Jesus as, as a disciple of Jesus. But I love this quote by Spurgeon. He's like a, a dead Baptist theologian, infamous, famous. He says here, every Christian is a missionary or an imposter. Let me know for a second. Every Christian is a missionary or an imposter. I think every Christian is a disciple or just a follower just an imposter. Discipleship looks like hours and hours and hours. It looks like 8,000 hours at least. It looks like a whole life shaped. Whereas Eugene Peterson says, the long obedience in the same direction. That's what it looks like to follow Jesus. It's long obedience. It's obedience to the course of a whole lifetime. It's like a lifetime of, of wandering away and then wandering back. It's like turning towards sin and turning away from sin. It's like looks like a long obedience in the same direction of pursuing Jesus. It looks like more than 8,000 hours. That's a starting point. It looks like us saying, Jesus, I want to spend time with you. I want to be shaped by you in community. I want my life to be marked by repentance. I want to have belief in you for any circumstance. If it's over my health or my family, over my wealth, I want to follow you. I want to have actually a long obedience in the same direction for the rest of my life, wherever you take me, in whatever circumstance I'm in, the brokenness or the good moments, I will follow you for the rest of my life because I'm a disciple of you. Let's pray. Jesus, you've called us to follow you. You've called us. Whether we know you, Jesus, some people in this room know you, some people don't. Father, I pray that we would actually put our faith and trust in you, that we'd repent and say, God, these are things in my life that I've turned into, leaned into. I don't even want to turn away. I want to run away from these things, but actually I want to spend years and years and years following you, Jesus. This is a long obedience in the same direction of believing you, of being shaped by you becoming more and more like you, Jesus. I thank you for these people. I pray that Live Free Church would be a community shaped 
by this message. We be apprentices of Jesus, disciples of you. Holy Spirit, come. Shape us and change us today. Amen.